space. Hey guys, I'm Josh, and yeah, I'll be talking about radius and diameter in sparse graphs. Um, so a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll begin with an overview of the radius and diameter problems, uh, just as a quick recap. Uh, next, I'll talk about the various hardness conjectures we'll be using to prove lower bounds for these two problems. Um, so in this work, we talk about both upper and lower bounds, and we managed to get some of them to match. So I'll talk about what hardness conjectures we need to prove the lower bound half of that. Um, I'll be going more briefly over our results for truly subquadratic approximation. In other words, like how well can you approximate these two problems in n to the 2 minus epsilon time? Uh, and then I'll spend more time trying to talk at depth about our fixed parameter subquadratic algorithms. And when we get to that section of the talk, I'll kind of explain what that term means. All right, so radius and diameter. So some quick definitions to begin. Uh, suppose we have a graph, g equals v comma e, and then we'll define the distance between two nodes u and v to be the length of the shortest path from u to v. And we'll define the eccentricity of a node, denoted uh, e of v there, as the uh, maximum distance from v to any other node. And so the radius problem just asks, what's the minimum eccentricity of any node inside the entire graph? And that node is called the center, so it says like which node can reach all the nodes quickly, and how long does it take to reach every other node from the center? And the diameter problem is just the maximum eccentricity, but it's really just the longest path in the longest shortest path in the graph. Um, it's not too hard to see that if you can solve all pairs shortest path or apps up, uh, you can solve this problem. Um, but apps up kind of outputs n squared. Uh, thing so there's n squared time just for outputting the information because it uh, outputs the information for all pairs and there are n things so there are n squared pairs. Um, so even when the graph is sparse, apps up will require n squared time. Um, but radius and diameter, because they just sort of output like one number, the eccentricity of the minimum eccentricity or the maximum eccentricity, maybe we could possibly do better. And uh, in particular, in this paper, not only do we study the normal undirected definitions of radius and diameter, we have the following natural extensions for directed graphs. So source eccentricity um, is kind of like the undirected version, but like you only care about the case where you want to get from V to the other nodes in the graph. Uh, round trip eccentricity is when you want to get to the other node in the graph, and you want to get back to your center node V for sources. Um, for maximum eccentricity, you care about the larger of the two distances, and uh, the, course, the natural follow-up definition is uh, min eccentricity, where you care about the smaller of the two distances, and it turns out that's actually a pretty hard, pretty hard problem. Um, so for all of these definitions, uh, we're still interested in the minimum eccentricity for radius and the maximum one for diameter. So for example, the source radius problem asks, what is the smallest source eccentricity in our graph? Um, and this leads to seven directed problems because two of them are actually the same. If you think about it, source diameter and max diameter are just asking you the same thing because it doesn't matter which way you take it for diameter. All right, uh, next I'm going to go briefly over the hardness conjectures uh, that we'll be using. So um, as everyone's probably really familiar with, the strong exponential time hypothesis by Impaglazo Paturi Zane just says there's uh, no 2 minus epsilon to the n algorithm for k set. And uh, it's been used, uh, yeah, way all throughout, not only throughout this workshop, but throughout this quarter to prove a variety of interesting lower bounds, and many of which show that, look, this algorithm we, wasn't, we weren't sure could be improved is actually tight. Um, specifically, we'll be using some more uh, polynomial time conjectures. So before I can list the conjecture, I'll define a problem. So for the first one is the orthogonal vectors problem, which you're probably all familiar with as well. Um, so you're just given two lists of n vectors uh, in uh, 0, 1 to the c log n. And the question is, is there a pair of, uh, is there an orthogonal pair? So a vector a from capital A, a vector b from capital B, such that the two are orthogonal. And the orthogonal vectors conjecture just says there's no truly subquadratic algorithm for this problem. Um, so the orthogonal vectors conjecture was actually used uh, by Rodity and Virginia, who I don't think is here at the moment, uh, to show that diameter is hard. Um, so we'll be using a different problem to show why radius is hard, and I'll, I will explain after I show you the next conjecture why we kind of need this sort of change in conjecture to explain why radius is hard. Um, so here's a very related problem. It's called the hitting set existence problem. So almost the same setup. Uh, you have two lists, n vectors. Uh, there are c log n coordinates. 
and you want to know, is there a vector in the first list that is not orthogonal to any vector in the second list? In other words, is there a, is there a, is there a vector in list A that hits every vector in list B? And then there's the analogous hitting set conjecture, uh, which matches the orthogonal vectors conjecture, but just for the hitting set existence problem instead. And the reason I've put these quantifiers up here uh, is to explain better uh, why we want to move to the hitting set existence problem for radius. Um, so for the orthogonal vectors problem, uh, it's an exists exists. Is there a vector in A and is there a vector in B such that this property holds? The hitting set existence problem, on the other hand, says, does there exist a vector in A such that for all vectors in B, we have a certain property? And uh, yeah, so the next slide explains this quite well. So how do we get from these hardness conjectures to lower bounds for radius and diameter? Um, and so for this slide, I'll show you how you can reduce the orthogonal vectors problem to a diameter-ish looking graph. Um, so I've written the problem up there again, uh, but the key idea is we'll make a set of nodes on the left corresponding to list A. Uh, each node on the left will represent one of the vectors from list A. And we'll do the same thing for list B on the right-hand side of this graph. And then finally, the center of the graph will have one node for every, uh, each one of the C log N coordinates. And then we simply hook up uh, two nodes if uh, the vector here has this coordinate on. So if it's on, we'll draw an edge. And so what does it mean for a pair to be orthogonal? So if a pair is not orthogonal, then they have a coordinate where they share a one. And in other words, so if, if there's some vector here and there's some vector here, and they actually are orthogonal, there'll be a two-hot path going between the two. Uh, and if they're not orthogonal, there won't be any two-hot paths because they won't share any of the coordinates in common. And you can kind of get a sense of why this leads to a diameter-looking graph. So we aren't quite at diameter yet. We have to take a few more steps to get to any diameter problem. But the key idea is that um, whether there's an orthogonal pair or not kind of determines whether uh, the diameter when you only consider endpoints in A and endpoints in B is 2 or 3 in this graph. Let me add a few widgets. Okay, cool. So, uh, how are these conjectures related and how believable is the hitting set existence conjecture? Um, so, like I said, orthogonal vectors, we use it to show our diameter bounds and we use hitting set to show radius bounds. Um, Ryan showed in 2004 that Seth implies uh, orthogonal vectors, and uh, we actually show the strange result that hitting set existence uh, implies orthogonal vectors, which is slightly counterintuitive. So if you recall, a hitting set was the exists for all version of the problem, and it has an alternating quantifier. So you kind of expect the problem to be more difficult than the exists exists version. Um, but this uh, reduction that we show in our paper actually proves that the other way around is true. The exists exists problem is harder than the exists for all, and it can be used to solve the exists for all problem. Um, yeah. Okay, so I will briefly go over our uh, results on how well radius and diameter can be approximated in truly subquadratic time. Oh, and we say sparse graphs in the title of this talk because we care about the case where m equals n. That's where most of these results are relevant because we're figuring out when uh, n squared is the right bound. Um, so I guess the inspiring paper for this work uh, was the one by Rodady and Virginia in 2013, uh, where they use orthogonal vectors to show that three halves is the right answer for undirected diameter and max diameter. And then so this is n to the roughly n to the 1.5 in a sparse graph. So um, what we do is uh, we extend these results to weighted setting. So like I said, um, the minimum eccentricity problems are rather difficult. Um, one interesting case for them is the case of DAGs. So on a DAG, minimum eccentricity is the only non-trivial uh, definition of eccentricity. Um, for everything else, because the distances between U and V are always at least infinity in one of the two directions, um, all the problems become trivial. So min diameter remains hard even for DAGs. Um, and then for round trip diameter, uh, so when I say metric for the algorithm, um, that just means that because uh, because the, uh, the eccentricity obeys the triangle inequality. If you just, any, if you just pick any point, um, it serves as a two approximation uh, for the diameter. And we managed to prove a three halves uh, bound from orthogonal vectors, um, but there's still a bit of a gap. Um, so our results for radius are all new because we're introducing the hitting set conjecture. 
um, we managed to show that the algorithm for undirected radius actually turns out to be tight under this new conjecture. Um, but surprisingly, we actually find uh, that a lot of other algorithms are tight, and not even at three halves. These other algorithms are tight at two. So for source radius, we present a two approximation algorithm. And this one's not trivial, because if you think about it, uh, source radius is not a metric. So just because there's a center that can reach everything quickly doesn't mean if I pick an arbitrary node, I can get to the center and then get to any other node quickly. Um, so we, we spend a bit of work proving a two bound, and then we also show a two lower bound from the hitting set conjecture. Um, max radius, uh, we show that the, the naive uh, metric using algorithm is tight, and min radius is still quite difficult, although we get just a uh, three to two gap on DAGs, and then we show that the metric case for round trip radius is tight. And uh, if you're interested in graph algorithms for radius and diameter, you should definitely take a look at the paper to see how we do these. Um, but like I said, for this talk, I really want to focus on our fixed parameters subquadratic algorithms. So what does this mean? Um, so this is a new framework called Frick's Parameter Tractable in P, and I guess the basic idea is that typically when you think about parameterized complexity, you want to know what problems can be solved in f of k times poly n time. And then sample k in this case are like, uh, what is the size of your clique, or what is the clause size of your sat instance, or what is the tree width of your graph. And typically, uh, this is applied to NP problems. It doesn't make sense for problems in P, because for any parameter, they're by definition FPT. You just use the same algorithm and you ignore the parameter. Um, but a more fine-grained approach would be to pin down what the correct exponent on the running times, in which case pulling out this f of k factor sometimes does matter. Maybe an algorithm is, you know, in this case, like maybe you think uh, it should take n squared time, but if you pull out f of k for the right choice of parameter k, you can beat n squared time. So what is the right exponent? And for our particular problems, the natural question is, can radius and diameter be solved uh, when we focus on tree width in truly subquadratic time after pulling out tree width, and what functions of k do we need? Um, yeah, so Giannopolo, Mertzios, and Niedermeyer um, also proposed an approach independently, uh, this approach in uh, the same year, um, but their paper only shows upper bounds. Um, our work both shows upper bound, an upper bound and a lower bound, and so it kind of shows we have all the tools we need to kind of pin down uh, the correct running times. And this is a pretty exciting new field. Um, some recent results that have followed. Uh, Fomin et al. Um, study max flow parameterized by tree width and many other problems, and they show roughly linear time algorithms for them. And then uh, Amir and some other co-authors also study the subtree isomorphism problem, and in this case, the parameter is the depth of the trees. So these are very recent results that have come after this work. And so the parameter we use is tree width. Um, I won't go too much in detail because uh, it was already covered in the boot camp. Um, but just a very, very brief uh, review of the definition. It's the parameterization of, under, uh, of undirected graph problems. And it kind of tries to capture when a graph is very close to a tree. So trees have tree width 1, and the complete graph has tree width n minus 1. So the fundamental takeaway from tree width is if your graph problem is easy on trees, maybe it's FPT with respect to tree width. And it turns out radius and diameter are very easy on trees, although it's not that obvious if you just try to do it at first glance. So the algorithm for diameter is folklore, um, but it goes as follows. You start at any vertex uh, v inside the graph, and you choose the, you find the furthest vertex from it. And uh, we claim that that has to be one of the endpoints of the diameter. And then you can just search from the furthest vertex for that for the other endpoint, and you'll know the diameter of the graph. And kind of the reason why this is true is if the diameter uh, doesn't involve u as one of the endpoints, um, then you can find a longer path inside the graph. Because inside a tree, there's really only one path between two nodes. And then you get radius for free after you solve that, um, just from the observation that the diameter has to fall pretty closely between uh, 2r minus 1 and 2r. So for example, if the diameter is 5, you know the radius has to just be 3. And if the diameter is 6, the radius still has to be 3. So like, you can just convert the diameter algorithm to a radius algorithm um, with this equation. Cool. So what do we do for tree width? Well, we solve all versions in 2 to the order k log k, um, plus a little more than linear time. And we also show that uh, 
So we solve all of the versions we presented exactly in that time, so including the directed versions, and uh, by tree width on directed graphs, we actually mean the tree width of the underlying undirected graph. So if you just undirect each edge and you measure the tree width of that graph. Um, and we also show uh, that even approximating any better than 1.5 into the little o of k and uh, truly subquadratic time would refute the appropriate hardness conjecture. So if you did it for a radius problem, you would violate the hitting side conjecture, and if you did it for a diameter problem, you would violate the orthogonal vectors conjecture. And uh, I will go more into the algorithms in this talk, but the lower bound idea comes basically, we take the constructions that uh, we've been using to prove our previous quadratic bounds, and we implement them with a graph where the tree width is small. And in this paper, it's actually pretty easy because, um, as is like, I think it's pretty commonly known, if you remove one node, then you lower the truth by most one. And as you can see in the construction, if you just remove all the nodes in the center, there's only a C log n of them. So, and then a uh, disconnected graph will just have uh, constant tree width. Cool. So I'll be covering how we get this runtime next. So what is our algorithmic strategy? Um, so we will solve both radius and diameter and more by computing the eccentricity of every single node in the entire graph. And the only way we will be using tree width is by the reduction to the following problem. So instead of a general graph, we'll be using the fact that it has small tree width in order to kind of subdivide it into two problems. So there'll be a node set on the left, a node set on the right, and the only way to get between these two uh, is the k nodes in the center. So this, this goes with tree width concepts like portal or separator, and uh, you can see the tree width k determines the size of the nodes in the middle that we have to deal with. And the other property of tree width that this that tree width gives us is that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are rather balanced, uh, so we will be recursing uh, on this. Cool. So like I said, um, our strategy will, will be recursing on S to find all the eccentricities within S, and we'll be recursing on the right-hand side as well, and then we'll just straight out run Dijkstra from the K nodes in the center because there's only a constant number of them, or K of them. And then the only thing, the only bit of information we're missing in order to fully figure out all the eccentricities is given a node on the left-hand side, so I give you a node on the left-hand side, what's the furthest node on the right-hand side? I already, already know the furthest node on the left-hand side via the recursive call, and I already know the furthest node in the middle because I have a Dijkstra call from the middle nodes. Okay, so we now have the following three-layered problem. So like I said, for each node on the left, what's the furthest node on the right? And we know it has to go through one of the nodes in the middle, so we can just write down our Dijkstra distances as weighted edges, and all of the distances we care about are only two hot paths inside of this graph. So uh, in order to get from A, inside capital A, to its furthest node here, we have to go through one of these K nodes in the middle. So um, I have the distances from K both to and from every other node in the graph. So it's just a two hot path at this point. Um, okay, so I just want to make a note right here that if K is equal to one, which happens only when the graph is a tree, uh, this problem is very simple. So the reason is uh, the answer is the same for every node A on the left. You just look at the furthest node C from the one single solitary middle node B, and that will be the furthest node from every node in A. So if K equals one, it's very easy, and then we'll kind of extend that intuition for K equals two. So what happens when K equals two? So there's two nodes in the center of our graph, there's B1 and there's B2. And uh, suppose we are processing and we find some A and we want to know the answer for that A. So all that A really gives us is the dis its distance to, to B1 and its distance to B2. And sort of the natural question is, which nodes in C is it the right answer to go through B1? And out of all those nodes, which one is the furthest from B1? Because that's the one we actually want to use uh, for A going through B1. And then by symmetry, we can do the same thing for B2, and we would have uh, the correct eccentricity for A. Um, so in equation form, uh, this is, uh, B1 is the optimal uh, portal node for a node C only if this equation holds. So uh, the path going through B1 to C is better than the path going through B2 to get to C. And then using a pretty standard rearrangement trick, 
when you're trying to make comparisons like this, uh, the left-hand side is uh, only de uh, dependent on A, and the right-hand side is essentially only dependent on C. So remember, we're given these at the moment, but we could pre-process these, and that's the key idea of the algorithm. So the right-hand side can be pre-computed ahead of time. So for every node in C, we'll associate with it, we'll, we will associate it with a point on a line, and it will be located at this coordinate. Then, when we get an A inside the left set, uh, we, we care about all the points on the line that are to the right of this coordinate. And then, out of all those points, we just want to know the one that is furthest from B1, because that's the one uh, that will be used if we use any node that goes through B1. So, like I said, uh, in this interval, which point is the furthest from B1? Uh, and if you're familiar with some data structures, uh, this is just a data structure problem. You can solve it, for example, uh, with a binary index tree. Um, but in general, when we have a larger k, we will have k minus 1 coordinates, uh, and it becomes the k minus 1 dimensional orthogonal range searching problem. So you're essentially given uh, the k minus 1 dimensional analog of an axis aligned rectangle, and you want to know what's the biggest point inside of this like, hyper rectangle. Um, and existing data structures can solve it in n to the log k minus 2n, so sort of one log faster than you would expect, and then uh, log to the k minus 2n query time. But we want to make n queries because we want to query every point uh, in A. Um, so our runtime is just, so uh, we, will, we will make one of these data structures for every point in the middle set B, and then we'll make n queries to each data structure. And so that'll cost kn log k minus 2 to the n. Um, and then we have to recurse on the left and right uh, sides. And the last thing was the Dijkstra call, but that's dominated by the first term. So I haven't written it down. Um, and then if you kind of solve this and you use the fact that the two sides were actually balanced, um, it turns out uh, you pick up a factor k because they're not completely balanced. They can be off by a factor of k uh, is the way the proof goes. And you pick up a log from recurring. Um, but you get this runtime, and then I guess the homework exercise is uh, use uh, standard fixed parameter tractable analysis to show that this is dominated by the original FPT time I wrote at the beginning. Cool. Uh, yeah, so some open questions. Um, so there was, a, there was an approximation gap for truly subquadratic algorithms uh, for round trip diameter, and there was an upper bound of two, uh, which is just the metric case, and we show three halves, um, is there a way to close this gap? And then perhaps more interestingly for the fixed parameter side, um, there's quite an interesting gap between this upper bound and this lower bound. So first of all, uh, this term compared to the little o of k term, uh, there's a gap is o of is it possible to like narrow uh, to improve this all the way down to o of k and uh, it might be necessary there's also a gap between this and this because this is almost one and that's almost two so maybe you could improve this if you increase this one a little bit and uh, the other note I want to make is our upper bound was exact and this lower bound even applies to anything up to a three halves approximation um, so yeah I think that's actually a really interesting question and then finally, um, a challenge, as most speakers have done, is like, what happens if you take the FPT and P framework and you apply it to your favorite problem in P? Can you say anything about how much the running time improves uh, when you're allowed to characterize by a parameter? All right. Any questions? Yes. More like a comment, so I'm quite sure that the algorithm for, um, that there is an algorithm for diameter that runs in time 2 to the k times log delta, where delta is the diameter times n. Okay? Uh, is delta in the exponent or? Okay, I see. K times log delta. So I, re I can replace u log k by a log delta, okay. which is sometimes worse and sometimes better. I see. But it's better if the, if the diameter is constant. Right, because then I it see, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That means that your lower bound is tight for those cases in which the diameter has is two or three, as it is in all your lower bounds. Yeah, you're right. Okay. okay so for those cases, the lower bound is the, the answer is 
So restricted to the regime where the diameter is 2 or 3 or 15 or your, your favorite constant, 2 to the k times n is the right answer. Which is kind of neat, I think. Yeah, that's, that's Do you understand the round trip diameter in this regime? Um, that makes sense, but so, so the directed round trip diameter for this. Are you talking about the FPT version? Uh, I am. I mean, there's, there's the same gap, like, because this algorithm also holds, and the lower bound for round trip diameter goes to tree width. So we get these two, but there's still the gap. So your algorithm holds for directed? Yeah, we have, our algorithm runs for all the directed variants, even min. Thank you. Well, uh, so two comments. One, I think, I think it's really nice what you did here. I think taking credit for being doing FPT on polynomial time problem, I'm sure that has been done. I mean, people in FPT have always tried to reduce the uh, complexity in the polynomial and all this kind of stuff. I'm just thinking that this is, I'm just saying it's not a completely new thing, I think, to apply FPT to polynomial time, that's all. I see, we actually didn't know of any previous work that had done it, but maybe easily. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 with you. So, okay, you can think of n times n as a uh, what's new is that we actually worry about n to the 2 minus epsilon, right? Yeah. Uh, lowering the, actually the polynomial runtime, where we know that under some plausible assumption, n squared is the best. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when you... Okay. Uh, so that's the new thing. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions?